Eau Claire that you took a little time out of perhaps teaching all morning and um, wanted to find out a little bit more about citizenship. We, uh, well, you probably read about the goals in the flyer, but first of all, I just want to tell you I'm Claris Esslinger and I teach down in Mankato. And I'll be talking a little bit more about my classes and that kind of thing later. So I'll pass it on to Anna. Hi, my name is Anna Mundy, and I teach in Burnsville ABE. Um, I've been with them for about seven years. I teach level two English, and then I've been teaching citizenship for about three years. And citizenship is my favorite class to teach, so I'm really excited to share with you today. And now I'll turn it over to Erin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Shudi Wodzinski. I'm an immigration attorney in uh, Worthington, which is in the southwest corner of the state. Um, I practice in my hometown. I was born and raised in Worthington, and um, I left in 2008 to attend college at Yale. I stayed on the East Coast to um, attend law school at UConn and returned home to um, begin my career in immigration law. So um, I've enjoyed partnering with um, adult basic ed teachers, and I'm, um, I feel very lucky to be able to join you all today. Thanks, Erin. And we cannot tell you how thankful Anna and I, Anna and I are that Erin was able to join us. We've also already just in the preparing, we have learned so much um, that's going to help our students. So we're really eager to have her share with you later on in the session. So yeah, the thing that prompted the session was the idea that, oh no, there's a new citizenship test coming out. And um, some people around the state had heard there's new questions and how are we going to teach these? And so I think, I don't remember the whole thing, but Patsy got a hold of me and I'm uh, mostly just facilitating the session. I'll share a little bit about my, my classes. Um, but as we began to think about citizenship, uh, we, we really felt like the civics test is just one, it's an important part, but it's just one part and perhaps not the most difficult part of obtaining citizenship. So we uh, looked a little bit wider at the process and we wanna share um, about the new test, but also give you the, the chance to ask questions to Aaron. And we're looking at some of the other obstacles to citizenship. And also we've got tons and tons of resources that even if we don't have a chance to go through them, they will all be on the slides and you'll have a chance to just explore them at your leisure. So I want you to look at number three, look at that goal there to identify obstacles. And I want you to think about uh, if maybe you have only heard about or have a friend who's gotten citizenship or maybe you're a citizenship teacher and your students keep coming up against something, what is the obstacle that you see? What is the hardest thing? And I want you to share those answers out in the chat if you can. All right, vocabulary in the N-400, anxiety, the N-400, money, good. The fee, getting proper, affordable, help, navigating the US CIS website, yep. Everything, <laughs> language barriers, preparing for the oral interview. Hmm. Not having enough English, transportation, language skills, and money. All right. This is great. And I, I think we're going to look at quite a few of these obstacles. The time delay, are, are you thinking the timeline between the different parts of getting citizenship, like between the biometrics and the interview. Some have thought they will pass if they have an attorney. Maybe Aaron will speak to that later. 
Only if you have Aaron. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for participating so quickly. Um, and Anne or Pat or Astrid, if you see things later that keep popping up, please feel free to, to shout them out as we're addressing these different things, okay? So for people that are just starting out in citizenship, we just wanted to give a quick overview. Um, we do have a slide in the resources that only speaks to the process. So you can watch a video and you can kind of go from A to Z on what the process looks like. I always choose one of those videos and show them to my students um, so they can they can just get a feel for filling out the, the N-400. That's the first part. Uh, well, first seeing if you're eligible, right? And that um, that might take a little bit just to find out if you're eligible before you begin the N-400 application. Um, I think a lot of our students call it fingerprinting, but in the USCIS information, it's called biometrics. And that's another appointment. And then the interview, which usually causes the most anxiety. And that includes the reading, the writing, the civics questions, and the N-400 questions. And that... Um, that is the N-400 questions have gotten, I don't think they always used to ask all of the questions on the N-400 application from my understanding, but now they pretty much go through each of those questions in the N-400, like, are you a habitual drunkard? Have you ever been a part of the communist party? So that is a lot of vocabulary. And I can see why many of you put uh, that a difficult part of teaching citizenship is that vocabulary in the N-400, because that's a pretty big part of the interview. And then the ceremony. Um, and the ceremony looks a little different now during COVID. Uh, one, one of my students got there, they actually had an online ceremony in September. And I noticed in, in some states, I don't, I'm not sure in Minnesota, but they actually, right after they finished the interview, they said, do you wanna take the oath? And an hour later, the person took the oath and they they were done. So uh, this, this is looking a little different during COVID, but the steps to the process haven't really changed. All right, just a few things about the new civics test. Uh, and we have more resources in the civics test slide at the end of the presentation. Um, the, the test that students have been taking since 2008 has 100 questions. And if you want more explanation on this, you can go to this video later. Um, but the, the document that I have found really helpful is this document by Reader's Press. And I guess it's particularly helpful to me because we use the Reader's Press um, Preparing for Citizenship book. So it actually goes through all of the questions and it tells you if the question is new and also what chapter it is in the book that you can find more information. Okay. But I want you to look at not only have there been additional questions, but the wording of a lot of the questions have changed. So if you look at number five, for example, and compare it across to number four, you can see that it's, they're calling it the same question, but it could be a little tricky for students. So it's worth looking at the, the changes in the wording of the questions that haven't changed as well. And we also have a, a document at the end that ha just tells what those additional 28 questions are. If you're really familiar with the other 100, then you can kind of see which ones you're missing. Uh, Clarice, right. we just have a question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, it says, the officer, a clarification, the officer will ask all 20 questions, even if they answered 12 correctly. No, my understanding is that once they answer 12 correctly, they will stop. Do you know any more about that, Erin? 
That's what I've been, that's what I've been told. Um, the, the person typing says that they took a USCIS training and said that all 20 questions will be asked. Um, I, I honestly don't know one way or another, but um, I imagine if they're saying in U the USCIS training that all 20 will be asked, then that's probably the case. Okay, good to know. That's good to know. We, I don't know anybody yet that's taken the new test. And if anybody does, I would love to hear what the experience has been. All right. The, the new test is not, um, it's not going to be used un, until someone who filed the application after December 1st. So right now, I, like, I don't think interviews are getting scheduled for people who filed last month. But I suppose in the coming months, we will, we will start to see this new test being utilized. That sounds, sounds good. And this video does explain a little bit about at the time that you apply and what exactly what Aaron said, if you, if you need to get a little more information about that. All right. Any other questions about the new test? Yeah, you're right. We should we should clarify it. But I, I think I'm going with Aaron. I would have them plan on that they're going to have 20 questions if that's what she heard in the USCIS um, training. Do we know if it will change with a new administration? I don't think anybody knows, but I'm going to let Aaron speak to that again. And uh, maybe during her, so our next chunk of time is for Erin and she's prepared uh, a bunch of information. It's these slides are really rich in information and they have a ton of text, but um, it's going to be helpful later, even though it might be a bit to wade through now because you're able to go back and get the details and look at it again if you don't catch it all the first time she goes through it. So Erin, thanks again. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'm going to hand over to you and you can just kind of let me know when to advance the slides. All right. Thank you, Claris. Um, yes, I'm going to share a lot of information with you. Um, I'm going to pause after a few slides and open it up for questions. So please keep typing in your questions to the chat box. Um, I hope that we can have kind of a dialogue and a conversation. And then I'll share a little bit more information with you. And then once again, open it up for questions. Um, so my, my thinking here uh, when I thought about, well, what information would be helpful to you? Um, I thought about how I can best support you as teachers to feel informed and equipped to advise your students on the naturalization process. And I see the partnerships that I have with ABE teachers as tremendously valuable. And where you all really come into play is at the very beginning of the process when someone is thinking about applying for naturalization um, before they even file an N-400. And then you also are really, really important after they file the N-400 as they prepare for their interview. And so I'm going to just share some, um, some of my own experiences and some recommendations and some information that hopefully will be helpful to you as you continue to work with your students. I, um, as an an attorney who represents individuals in their naturalization application, um, I go to Minneapolis and attend the naturalization interviews with clients. So I have sat in countless of naturalization interviews, um, taking copious notes with each and every one of them. So um, I'm happy to answer questions about what an interview is like um, and how maybe you as teachers can provide um, some tips for students who may not have an attorney to go with them to the interview, but how they can feel most prepared and comfortable. Um, but first of all, and Claris, you can go to the next slide. Um, I want to just share some basic information with you about how you can, um, 
help assess whether or not an individual is eligible for citizenship. Because you might have students in your class who um, are eligible and don't know that they are, or maybe on the flip side, are super gun ho and want to become a US citizen, but they're not quite eligible yet. So the main thing that is important to know is that um, someone needs to be a citizen for, or be a lawful permanent resident for at least five years, generally speaking, before they can apply for citizenship or three years if they got their green card through marriage. And this slide here just shows what um, lawful permanent resident cards, also known as green cards, have looked like over the years. So um, if, if a student comes to you and is willing to show you what their green card, um, you can expect to see it look like one of these four green cards or one of these four styles. You can go to the next slide. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Clarice. There's a question just before I go to the next slide that says on the bottom right, I see no expiration date of residence. Yes, so this is the oldest green card, the one in the bottom right. And in like before the 1990s, green cards did not have expiration dates. So this is a green card that's probably from the 80s. Thanks. So um, the reason it's kind of helpful to familiarize yourself with a green card is because it can give you a lot of information um, that will help you determine whether or not someone meets the, the year requirement um, necessary before applying for citizenship. So you want to ask, well, have you been a resident for more than five years? And at the very bottom of the green card, you can see the date in which they became a resident. And um, like I briefly mentioned, if someone got a green card through a spouse, so if their husband or wife had petitioned them, then they only have to be a resident for three years before they can apply for citizenship. And th this is sometimes, you know, it might be a little bit confusing or ambiguous about like who petitioned them and how did they get a green card? Well, you can look in the category section of the green card, which I have also highlighted here. And IR1, F2, CR1 are all um, spousal categories without going into too much detail. And those are the three categories that would make someone eligible to apply for citizenship after only three years of residency. Any other category requires five years of residency. For the people who are really, really excited about applying, and I love those people, um, they can actually apply 90 days before their five-year anniversary or 90 days before their three-year anniversary. So that's as soon as someone can apply for naturalization. So if you have a student and they have been a lawful permanent resident for the sufficient number of years, then you can say, Yep, looks like now is a great time to start thinking about the application process. And you may be in a position where you can evaluate um, the, the lawful permanent residence language skills that are required for a naturalization interview. And I think um, you all kind of can have better assessment techniques than I do, of course. And so you think you just want to be mindful of their ability to read, write, and speak in English. And if they are not able to do any or all of those things, um, I will, I'll talk about what are some of the exceptions and when might an individual be able to have an interview or an a interpreter in the interview. I'm going to speak to the language requirement just for a second. Um, yeah, we have um, something called the CASAS, Erin, that we have that we test reading and writing skills of students or listening skills. And I have talked to quite a few teachers of citizenship, and they use a 190 cut score for their citizenship class. If you're new to citizenship and you're not sure what to do, 
Um, so this fall, I, I had a request to try three students that were in the very first level and they had, they were probably in the 170, 180 and I can just tell you it didn't work. They really needed to get a little more English before they're gonna be able to even do the most basic components of the citizenship process. So maybe later other teachers will wanna speak to that more, but we, um, uh, I know quite a few people have generally used a 190 cut score as a requirement for the reading to get into citizenship class. All right, thanks, Erin. Awesome, thank you, Claris. Um, so, I, I see that there is a question about children of citizenship, but I'm, I'm gonna stick to the language piece just for a moment and then I'll get back to your question. Um, there are kind of two ways that someone is eligible for an interpreter to be brought into the interviewer. And, and just so you all know, the applicant must bring their own interpreter to a naturalization interview. USCIS does not provide interpreters. In the language exemption waiver is one way that someone can kind of automatically qualify for an interpreter. And this is if someone has um, been a lawful permanent resident for at least 20 years and is over the age 50, or they've been a lawful permanent resident for at least 15 years and are over the age of 55. So this is the, like the 50, 20, exemption or the 5515 exemption, you can remember it because it all adds up to 70. And in this case, the applicant still needs to take the civics test, but they can will do it with an interpreter. And they do not have to do the reading or writing test. For someone who has been a lawful permanent resident for 20 years or more, and is over the age 65, then they will be able to get an interpreter and they get a um, special civics test that where they don't have to study quite so many questions. So it's just making it a little bit easier to study for that test. Um, now that is considered an exemption waiver. There's also a medical certification for disability exceptions and this sort of exception is not automatic. Um, it's an application that is submitted with the N-400. So it has to be prepared at the same time as the N-400 and requested in advance. But if approved, um, if, and it, you won't know until it's approved until you're sitting in the interview room with your interpreter, um, then you can have it, an interpreter throughout the entire interview, just like for the exemption waiver. In order to get a, a medical certification, um, it's a form that is signed by a doctor um, indicating that the applicant has a physical or, men, physical or developmental disability or a mental impairment. And there's very specific guidelines on what, um, what qualifies as a physical or developmental disability or a mental impairment. Um, it has to be something that has been ongoing for at least a year or is expected to last at least a year. And um, if this application form is approved, then an applicant may be excused from the language requirements and the civics test altogether because the medical professional is attesting that based on the disabilities, they are not able to learn the English language. So, um, common disabilities include depression, anxiety, PTSD, and dementia. Um, not limited to those, but those are some of the most common disabilities that um, I see through my work with clients. So the link that I provided on this slide really dives into a lot more details, but I think you as, as teachers can can see, you know, do they, you know, you first you want to look at the age um, exemption, the language exemption waiver, their age and how long have they been a resident. And if that's the case, that's great. <laughs> um, if they don't qualify for a language exemption waiver, then you maybe want to have that sensitive conversation with them to see if there are would be any 
possibilities that would suggest that maybe they get referred to um, a medical professional who could do an evaluation and consider filling out this form. Now, I, I've talked a lot about partnerships and I think partnerships are key to providing strong support to applicants through the naturalization process. And I work with a um, mental health provider here in, in Worthington where I refer clients for these medical certifications. So they can, um, I'll refer them to this doctor who like is experienced with filling out the form, kind of understands the purpose of it, the kind of evaluations that are required of the patients. And it, it's so nice to be able to work with a, a provider directly on this and make sure that the applicant is, is in good hands. Because as you can imagine, this is a, it's a sensitive topic and neither you nor I can make medical diagnoses, but if we can, work with those who can, and we all work together to provide support to applicants, then, then you know, we know that they're in good hands. You can go to the next slide. All right, so these are, these are some of the considerations or suggestions I have um, in order to help students determine if now is the time to pursue an N-400 uh, application for naturalization. So I want to just pause there for a few minutes and answer any questions that have come to mind so far. So one that I see quite a bit here is, does the USCIS have approved have an approved list of physicians or does the doctor have to be approved by the UCIS? How does that work? So they, there are some immigration, like medical immigration forms that require a civil surgeon to sign the form, but this is not one of those forms. It has to, this has to be a clinical psychologist, a medical doctor, or a doctor of osteopathy. Those are, you have to have that certification in order to fill out an N648. So, um, that you know you can't have a PA do it, you can't have a nurse do it. it has to be MDDO or clinical psychologist. Okay. So you mentioned the civil surgeon, and I, I hear a lot about that in the citizenship um, processes. Could you explain the difference or what they can only do? A civil surgeon is um, a special certification that the US government gives to certain doctors who apply for it. That's my understanding. And civil surgeons can complete um, like physical medical examinations that um, applicants for adjustment of status, so green card applicants must do in order to become lawful permanent residents. That's where I've worked with civil surgeons before with that in that adjustment of application, adjustment of status process. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if now is an okay time to talk a little bit about children and how you handle uh, and what age and how that goes on to the application, wasn't? Sure. So when I, um, well, let, let me just back up a, a little and preface my answer. Um, I think that once once you have a sense that there is a student who is ready to pursue naturalization, I strongly recommend that their first step is to find a legal professional who can screen them for, well, all sorts of things. In particular, grounds of inadmissibility, which are um, little things that maybe have happened in their past that would cause bumps in, along the road towards citizenship. Um, I'll talk later on about what kind of legal professionals or where you can find them to, to kind of refer your students to. Um, but one of, one of the first things that I talk with 
clients about um, includes, do you have any family members who are US citizens? Because if someone is a lawful permanent resident and, or if a child is a lawful permanent resident and their parent becomes a US citizen before the child turns 18, the child automatically derives citizenship from the parent. But in order for that to happen, the child must be a lawful permanent resident and must be under 18 when the parent takes the oath of citizenship. So that's good to know if you have a student whose parents are citizens. And it's also good to share with students who have children who are lawful permanent residents and under 18 because that's an extra added bonus or perhaps incentive for the student to pursue citizenship before their children turn 18. Does that require some kind of extra application outside of the N-400 application? Or is there a space for children to be included? So the this is where it can get a little bit tricky and I don't wanna to get too far into the mm -hmm. week here, but um, a child under 18 who's a lawful permanent resident will automatically derive citizenship from their US citizen parent. However, they won't have proof of citizenship because they won't get a naturalization certificate for at an oath ceremony, only the parent will. And without that proof of citizenship, it can be really hard to get a US passport or any other proof of citizenship. So there's a special immigration form called N-600 which is similar to the N-400, but different. And that is meant for people who automatically derived citizenship somehow, but need to request a certificate of citizenship for proof. And, and I work with students or you know young kids to request the certificate of citizenship. It's, it's one, I mean, one side note is that you don't have to be under 18 to request that certificate of citizenship. If you derived citizenship before you were 18, but didn't apply for the certificate, even as an adult, you can apply for that certificate of citizenship. That helps me a lot. I hope it helps you guys too. We're getting some great uh, tips for during the interview that, you know, you can ask uh, the officer to repeat things, to slow down. Uh, some of the teachers are saying that they feel like there's a, a kind of a big difference in who passes. They're kind of surprised sometimes. Um, some are saying they feel like there's a little bit uh, fewer questions perhaps for those that have already seemed to show a high language ability. Is this, do you want to go through the rest of your, and then, and then talk about what you see with students when you actually are with people applying when you actually go into the interview with them or is this a good time for that Erin? I'm I'm happy to chat a little bit about this now and then maybe there will be some follow-up questions but their interviews do vary and uh, in immigration officers vary in their techniques and styles and while there's there is kind of a normal interview it very rarely are their normal interviews so um, I think that's another reason why I often feel like I'm glad I'm there. Like I'm glad that an applicant has an attorney to sit with them and sometimes interject a little bit because it's the officer, well, I'll just, I'll talk a little bit about what an interview is like. Um, so all of you, are in Minnesota, I presume. And so your clients are Minnesota residents, which means that their interviews are likely going to take place in Minneapolis. It's in downtown Minneapolis. Parking can be hard to find. And the USCIS office is on the seventh floor of a skyscraper. So that alone can be very frightening and daunting to applicants. Um, hopefully the applicants have done some practice appointments, maybe with their teachers or an attorney uh, so that they feel comfortable and kind of know what to expect. But once they go through security and are in the waiting room, they will be called by a number that they're given when they check in. 
and taken down a long hallway to um, like a, a small office because it's just kind of a, a row of offices. And in each office, there's an immigration officer conducting an interview. Um, I want to say there are maybe like 10 to 12 different immigration officers in Minneapolis who conduct interviews. So you don't know who you're going to get. And like I said, there is a range of styles and techniques and just personality types. Um, when the applicant first sits down then in the office, the uh, officer will ask them to take an oath, raise their right hand and promise that they're going to tell the truth and answer all the questions to the best of their ability. Um, the officer will start off generally by um, asking the questions on the N-400, which start out pretty basic. What is your name? Where were you born? What is your date of birth? What, what is your country of citizenship? What is your phone number? What is your address? And that information, the applicant should just be able to recite. Um, then the, the officer will get into all of the yes, no questions on the N-400. And some officers will ask the questions in order, word for word. And you know that most of the answers to those questions are no. So applicants can be ready to say no, 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 no. Well, some officers will switch up the wording of the questions so that the applicant really needs to listen carefully to know whether or not they need to answer yes or no. And some officers get a little fancy with that and, and they like to be tricky. But you know, for someone who's comfortable in the Eng English language, it's, they're not gonna get tripped up. But someone who is really nervous or less confident in their language abilities might, um, might need to ask the officer to repeat the question or rephrase the question or speak more slowly. And that's totally fine to do that for the applicant to ask the officer to do that. If there are any um, kind of red flags in the applicant's background, like if their background check um, showed that they have been arrested and that corroborates with the information that they disclosed on the N-400, the officer will likely ask some questions about that. Um, you know, what, what happened? Um, what were the consequences of that? When did it happen? And so the applicant should be prepared to kind of talk about it a little bit. Same things with like um, filing taxes. Well, if you if you don't file taxes, why don't you file taxes? Well, I don't earn enough income to file taxes. You know, just having having an explanation or a response to things that are not totally standard or clean on an application is really important. So usually all of that happens before we even get to the reading, writing, and civics test in the interview. Um, the, the officer will also ask, do you um, support the US Constitution? If the law requires it, are you willing to bear arms on behalf of the United States? There's, there's like six oath related questions that, that they will definitely ask word for word. And then um, in front of the applicant is like a little iPad on a stand. And when they get to the, the language portion of the test, they will ask the applicant to read a sentence. And usually the sentence is like three to eight words long and is related to civics in terms of vocabulary. Um, and then on the same iPad, the applicant will be asked to write a sentence and the officer will verbally say the sentence and will repeat it many times if asked and the applicant has to write it on the iPad. And then the last piece of the interview is the civics test. And that's where the officer will verbally ask the questions and they need to be verbally answered. Um, if they pass that, um, and Anna pretty soon will give some details about tips you can use on how to support your students in passing the test. 
um, then the officer will say that they recommend the applicant for approval. And at least what I've seen lately, they will um, let the applicant know that they will receive a letter in the mail scheduling them for an oath ceremony. So applicants are um, asked to return to uh, Minneapolis at a later date to attend a small oath ceremony. So that's perhaps more detail than you wanted, Claris, but um, that that's, I guess, um, yeah, what I can say about what it's like to attend an interview. That's, that's great. I actually typed out those steps and they're on a slide now for everybody. Uh, just that little description even of going down to mini, downtown Minneapolis. I think you could see where a little anxiety might form. So um, let me just see if, it, if I go back, if it's... I think we might've missed one question in the chat too from pa Pamela. Um, she said, so there is paperwork and interviews to get your green card and then you have to reapply for permanent residency and do more paperwork, the test interview, and then the oath. Okay, so this, this is kind of a question that's asking, well, what is the process leading up to applying for citizenship? Um, in order to be eligible for naturalization, you need to have that, you need to be a lawful permanent resident, which is shown by having a green card. Um, there are many different ways for an individual to receive a green card. It's either going to be through family-based immigration, employment-based immigration, or a various type of humanitarian form of immigration relief. And that is, um, I'm not going to go into detail about all the different ways someone can get a green card, but if they, um, they either apply for a green card in the United States or in their country of origin and travel to the United States as a lawful permanent resident. And a green card is typically valid for 10 years. So if someone is ready to apply for citizenship after five years or three years, they'll never have to renew their green card. But for multiple reasons, some people choose to renew their green card after 10 years and delay, the, delay applying for naturalization. I hope Pamela that answers your question. All right, I think we're gonna keep keep on moving here. We got a couple, about five more minutes for Aaron. So let's uh, maybe okay. let you keep on, Aaron. Okay, yikes. Um, question, do students not go to Duluth anymore? I'm, I'm honestly not 100% sure on that since it's so far away from where I live that well, I think maybe people from Northern Minnesota do have a small office in Duluth where they do interviews. So yeah, that might be right. And some Tracy is saying that they have Fargo. So if, if applicants are able to interview in North Dakota, that's great. My clients used to be able to interview in Sioux Falls, but um, now USCIS what is not allowing interviews across state lines or at least they don't allow Minnesotans to interview in South Dakota anymore. So I don't know if that is the case for Fargo or not. But um, what else is helpful for you to know in order to share information with students? Um, there is an application filing fee of $725 that is paid to US Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, someone may qualify for a fee waiver, which means they will not have to pay the $725, but they will have to submit um, a fee waiver application form along with their N-400. They qualify for that either through um, their being under, in, under an annual income threshold set by the federal poverty guidelines, um, or if they receive um, food stamps or cash assistance or some other form of federal public assistance. In terms of timeline, um, I'm right now I'm seeing the application process taking about six to nine months um, for applicants in Minnesota who are applying for naturalization. 
So this is from, I'm six to nine months from the time that N-400 is filed to when the interview is scheduled. That's generally what, I, what I'm seeing. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I do recommend that you encourage your students to seek out some um, legal guidance at, at a minimum to be screened by a legal professional to make sure that there aren't going to be any major bumps in the road. Um, there are individuals who are lawful permanent residents, but have um, maybe made some mistakes or had some um, circumstances at some point in their lives that actually trigger a ground of inadmissibility or a ground of removability. And if this happens, um, the worst case scenario, if they apply for an N-400 is that the application would be denied and then they would receive a, a letter that is a notice to appear asking them to go to immigration court. So I, I have had consultations with individuals who, you know, appear to have a really clean case, but then once you have a longer conversation with them, you realize that, yikes, I think you trigger a, a ground of removability. I don't recommend that you apply for citizenship. It's best to just hang on to your green card and don't submit an application to immigration. So there is a lot on the line. It can be quite stressful. Um, and, and even if someone feels like they have a, you know, a very clean background, it's just good to take that extra step to have a conversation with someone who can talk about um, what, what grounds could be triggered and how. So um, when, I, when I say that, you know, it's good to at least have a conversation with a legal professional, um, the applicant or the student could still go on to file the N-400 on their own, but having the conversation with um, a legal advisor could be done through um, like at, at a traveling clinic, you know, not during COVID, but after COVID. Um, the University of Minnesota School of Law has a traveling clinic that goes out to greater Minnesota um, on a regular basis and does kind of free screening clinics for individuals. Um, and there's also a website called Law, Law Help Minnesota that provides good information for individuals who do want to do the application process on their own. Um, Minnesota has um, a nonprofit called Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota that provides free representation to low income immigrants and refugees. I worked at Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota before I opened my own practice. And um, individuals do have to meet certain income thresholds to qualify for the free legal services, but naturalization is um, kind of the bread and butter of Immigrant Law Center. And they are statewide. Um, Minnesota Council of Churches is also another great resource for, for individuals who got their green card as either a refugee or an asylee. Um, and then if an individual is unable to get an appointment at a nonprofit or doesn't qualify for their services, yet wants to seek out legal advice uh, or, or legal representation, they can find an immigration attorney. And in greater Minnesota, we are um, few and far between, but the Twin Cities does have um, quite a few good immigration attorneys in private practice who um, work with individuals on um, naturalization. So I put my link here, but full disclosure, Kivu Immigration Law is me. Um, and I mean, in general, I'm just happy to be a resource to any of you if you have questions about um, how you can better support your students or how changing immigration policies are impacting the students you work with. Um, I wanna be helpful to you. And that's, that's why I'm here today. Erin, thank you so much. I feel like I could just listen to you all the rest of the day and I have learned so much. And we actually asked Erin to put her contact law firm on there because we just thought it was really important that um, students had somebody they could trust even though it is, it's a paying practice. 
So we are going to move on so that you get some resources and some of Anna's experience. And I just love that there's a lot of things already being answered in the chat. Uh, we'll hopefully come back to unanswered things in a few minutes. So Anna, I think we're going to go right into some of the questions from the new civics test that you have prepared for us. And hopefully we'll have more time for questions at the end. All right, sounds good. So we're gonna do a short activity um, and I hope it'll be kind of fun for you guys. Um, we want to see, could you pass the new citizenship interview? So we want you to listen to three of the civics questions that are from the new 128 questions. And then we'd like you to give your answer in the chat box to see how you would do on the new test. So the first question I have for you is what is the purpose of the 10th Amendment? What is the purpose of the 10th Amendment? So you can go ahead and type um, if you know the answer in the chat box or your best guess. All right, so we see Jason said federalism, states' rights. Tax, police, presidential succession. These are some of the answers we're getting from the chat box, uh, state power. So yes, <laughs> I see some people have given the correct answer. So some of you must have been studying or else you are teachers that have been forced to study the information for the new test. So the correct answer to that question is the 10th amendment states that the power is not given to the federal government belong to the states or to the people. So that is the long answer that is given by USCIS as an acceptable answer for the interview. Um, the second question I have for you is Supreme Court justices serve for life. Why? So why do Supreme Court justices serve for life? Right, so some people said to be independent of politics, maintain independence. Yeah, so again, the correct answer yep, is to be independent of politics. And the other acceptable answer given by USCIS is to limit outside political influence. And the third question I have for you is, why did the United States enter the Persian Gulf War? Why did the United States enter the Persian Gulf War? Some people, a lot of people here said for oil, um, invasion of Kuwait, Oh, Iran invaded Kuwait. So the correct answer as given by USCIS um, is to force the Iraqi military from Kuwait. So you can see that a lot of the questions, um, the acceptable answers that USCI get, USCIS gives are pretty long. And they tend on to ask a lot of the why questions on the new test. So they've rephrased a lot of the questions to make them a lot more complex so that the learners have to give a longer answer. So I want you to think about that if you were given a list of 128 questions about the history and government of a country that you did not grow up in, Imagine that you are given a test on those questions. 
in a language in which you have very limited proficiency. So how would you feel in that situation? And that's how our citizenship students feel every time they enter our classroom. So they have to learn these complex questions in a language that they are learning at the same time as they are studying for their citizenship interview. So our students have a huge mountain to climb as they are preparing to take the citizenship test. Uh, Claris and I thought it would be helpful just to share with you a little bit how we structure our citizenship classes, just so you can see what a real class might look like and to get some ideas for activities. Um, so my citizenship class, uh, this is an example when we're not in the middle of the pandemic. So this is what my class would look like on a normal um, Friday class. So normally my citizenship class meets for three hours only on Friday mornings and it's from 9.30 to 12.30. And I always like to begin with an introduction. So I like to start with some of the small talk questions that the um, applicants might get asked at their interview. Um, usually they begin with some, at least that's what I've been told, is they begin the interview with small talk questions, kind of as a test of the student's English ability. So I might ask my students to practice questions like, how are you doing today? How do you like the weather today? How was the traffic today? Or how was the parking situation today? And this gives, gets students speaking so that they're more comfortable just going into their interview and helps them to relax and prepare as much as they can. Um, then we always say the Pledge of Allegiance together at the beginning of class. They don't actually have to say the pledge um, or anything like that at their interview but there are questions in the civics portion of the test about the Pledge of Allegiance. And so after we say the pledge, I like to review the civics questions that are related to the flag. Um, so for example, some of the questions are, why does the flag have 50 stars? Why does the flag have 13 stripes? Um, what do we show loyalty to when we say the Pledge of Allegiance? And then what is the national anthem? Just so they get used to hearing a few of the civics questions right away in the class introduction. Um, after the intro, then I like to start out with some sort of warm up. Uh, I do this a few different ways. When we're in person, I usually like to have some sort of review handout. And this would be something that would review the previous week's reading. Um, so I might do something like vocabulary matching. Uh, you might do like an important date and then an event that they have to match together for some of the different wars um, about when the constitution was written and things like that. Um, you could do important people matching. There are a lot of different people they have to know on the interview. So I'd give them a name and then what did the person do so they can uh, remember what all the important people did. Um, or sometimes I'll just give them pair questions, maybe some of the application questions that they can practice in pairs to get them more speaking practice for their interview. Um, after the warm up, we move into the civics and interview questions practice. Um, I was very blessed last year at my school in Burnsville. We had three fantastic volunteers for citizenship class. So they helped me out a ton. We could divide our class into uh, four different groups. And so we were able to do a lot of mock interviews. Um, this year online, I don't have as many volunteers, but we make it work the best we can. Um, but some other ideas that you could do to practice the civics questions that I have tried in my class um, include a civics question like Jeopardy game that I've done on the smart board. 
I included a link later in the resources that you could use to create something of your own. Um, so we've done that on the smart board. Um, I've also done another smart board activity, like a sorting activity. Um, an example of that would be with the three branches of government. So I might at the top of the smart board, I have the name of each of the branches of government. And then the students have to drag and drop. They would come up to the board and you can use your finger on the smart board to drag and drop um, what would go into each category for the different branches of government. So they would have to say, which branch does the president belong to? Um, which branch does Congress belong to? And so that they could just an interactive activity to help them get moving in the class a little bit more so they're not just sitting when they're in person. And, and I think when they do something interactive, it helps them to remember the information better too. Um, we've, we also, when we're in person, we do mingle activities to practice the civics questions. So I might have all of the 128 questions written on an index card, um, and then you can laminate them so you can use them over and over again. And then each student will take a, a few questions and then they all have to stand up and mingle around the classroom and ask their questions to some of their classmates. And then after they finish asking their question, then they can swap questions with their classmate so that they get to walk around and practice a lot of different questions. Um, then we take a 15 minute break just because a three hour block of time is a long time to sit. Uh, and then after the break, we move into the reading and writing practice. So I like to focus on five sentences per week so that they're not overwhelmed with, with all of the reading and writing at one time. So I'll give them a homework handout with the five sentences to practice. And uh, I believe it's in the back of the New Readers Press textbook that I use. They have a list of all the sentences pre-made so that I didn't have to come up with my own sentences for the reading and writing practice. So it has a whole list of all the questions and the answers that incorporate all of the vocabulary that they have to know for the interview. Um, and every week I do a dictation with the five writing sentences. So I'll have them first write in their notebooks and then, then they like to take turns coming up to the board and writing the sentences and then we check them all together. Um, and then after the reading and writing, we do the new chapter in the reading textbook. So I think Clarice and I both use the civics and literacy textbook from New Readers Press. Unfortunately, it's not, yeah, and Clarice is holding it up there if you can see her on camera. Unfortunately, it's not yet updated for the 128 questions but all of the information in the book is still excellent. So you can still use it to adapt. Um, and then after the reading, we do the homework practice. So I, I like to do a lot of my homework through WhatsApp groups. So I have um, WhatsApp groups with my students and then I can send them some teacher created videos that I made. Um, I've been working on a, creating a YouTube channel that I put all the reading and writing sentences and then I'm also recording the civics questions. And then Google Classroom is another great resource. Uh, um, I'm working on building a Google Classroom right now and it's just a great way because you only have one link then that you have to share with your students and then they can get access to all of the practice and all of the homework. So obviously this is for my in-person class. So my online classes are slightly different. Um, 
For my online classes, I had to divide my students into two different groups. So one of my groups of students focuses on the old test, and then my second group focuses on studying for the new test. So, and then we use Google Meet for our platform. And if you have any questions about how any of the things I mentioned, you can always send me an email. I'm happy to share more about it. And I think Claire. Sure, I'll go on. Yeah, I'll um just add a couple things. We do a lot of things similarly. I teach online twice a week, uh, one and a half hour classes, no breaks. And uh, we have been teaching citizenship online since last March or April. So like I said before, we do follow a cut score of 190. Um, pretty, some, some things are similar and I won't go through everything, but one of the things I found really helpful is the interviews that can be found um, online. And before uh, I used to just, we would watch mock interviews. But now what I do is I turn off the sound and the students actually take part in the role play. So I'm just going to show you one of them and the students read the parts. And I think that it really gives the students the chance to grapple with all of the N400 questions. They're hearing, I'll, I'll give you, we'll play a little bit more. So I'll have students play the role of the officer and of the person being interviewed. And we'll just do a few minutes of this every day. There's lots of them online that you can find and we've included a lot in the resources. But I have found this much more effective than just watching the interviews because I feel like then they actually will find out what words they don't know, what they're uncomfortable with and that kind of thing. I do use the same book as, as Anna and find that really helpful. The USCIS website has awesome lessons that follow that, follow, well, they don't follow the book exactly, but they um, can give you a chance to review the things in the book. So for example, today I used a, a USCIS geography lesson to go kind of reiterate what we learned in unit two of the book. Um, and then I also have some of my own presentations that just can help us to keep on reviewing this one I shared with everybody. I can't take credit for this. One of my coworkers put this together who actually got her citizenship four years ago. And uh, the reason that you might like to use this is in the notes of the presentation, the actual citizenship questions from the test are listed. So you can present the material and then you can ask the questions in the notes and the students can interact with the presentation that way. This is not, well, it looks like it's been updated because we have new pictures. We have the new um, Kamala, Kamala Harris and um, President Biden, but we don't have the 28 questions. The other, these, this doesn't have 128 questions, but it has all the questions around government in this presentation. So feel free to use that. Um, I do, because I am online and it's for a long time, we have tried to figure out different ways to be interactive. Um, the learning chocolate, if I stick a link in the chat, students can go practice the N400 vocabulary for a few minutes on their own. Um, we also have tried cahoots where students have a code on their phone and then they can shoot up the answers. Um, the Jamboard has been pretty helpful for doing a little bit of interaction. The citizenship class, as you probably also experience, is really varied from um, you know GED students to students that just barely reach the cut score. So I have just yesterday trained in a, a volunteer that I'm really um, excited about having in a breakout room to work with students that need a little bit more language practice as we're going along. And then, and then in the USCIS lessons, they have intermediate level and beginning level. So with those higher level students, it's more fun for them to do the intermediate level. And occasionally the volunteer can do 
the book or the lower level lessons with the less, uh, with the students that are grappling with the language. Um, I think for me, that is good right now. Anna, why don't you, do you want to look at, well, Anna's not going to tell you, I have to tell you about her resource. We have got, we've got so many resources here that we're going to just look at a few of those. So you can see we have some for interview practice. We have, oh dear, I think I went on to one of them. That's not what I meant to do. Um, the N400 actual application is here. And then ways to learn the N400 vocabulary. These are the videos I was referring to about the naturalization process. But I want to show you, Anna has created YouTube. Here, you see the second one is Anna's YouTube channel. And she has done lots of videos um, for students to practice their reading and writing, especially. So Anna, if you want to say more about that, or if you want to point out some of your resources, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, yeah. Um, so as Patsy mentioned in the chat, all of these links will be in the slides. So you can go through and click on them later and it should take you directly to the sites. Um, for the reading and writing, I think that anything that has audio is really good. So whenever you can get your students to have something where they can listen to the sentence at home on their own time and then they can practice writing it. Um, that's some of what I did on my YouTube channel. So far I only have the reading and writing portion recorded. I am working on the 128 civics questions that are planned to record them based on the different themes so that I can send them to my students as homework based on each chapter that they're learning in the book. Um, but for the YouTube videos, I recorded the sentences that they have to know. And then I would pause on the video to give them a chance to listen and write the sentence. And then on the following slide, I show them the correct answer. So that's a way that they can practice doing the dictation at home. And then when we come to class the following week, we all write them together so that they get practice with what they learned at home that week. Um, a lot of these on the reading and writing are also linked to USCIS's page, uh, a specific part of their page. Um, one of the things I like for the low level learners is the vocabulary copy sheets. Um, those have just, like one of the words at a time so that students can just practice writing those specific words over and over again, some of the bigger words that they might have a lot of trouble with. And so those are really good for the beginning students just to focus on individual words before they start putting them into sentences. Um, do you want me to go back to anything or, you know, we've got two minutes left. So one thing we want to make sure of is that any of you participants that have resources that you don't see up there, we would love for you to share them in the chat and we will add them and then they will get shared out to everybody. If you have something that you think we could all benefit from, that would be awesome. And Anna, if you, you have another minute, if you want to if you want to point out anything else, I didn't, I went pretty quick through all of this stuff, um, um, but. Or yeah, there was somebody... one resource, I think it was in the uh, in N400 practice. Oh, I see it on this slide here, Clarice. Um, they have the yes and no interview questions. That's a YouTube video that will allow them to listen to some of those application questions that they might hear. And then it gives a sample answer to those questions. And then they can practice writing their own answer to those questions at home so they can re be prepared. Um, USCIS also had some good videos or they had a link to another website. Um, let's see, it was the... Okay 
the learn and explore videos. Um, that's under the civics questions practice. And those cover content from the textbook that we use, but it divides them according to the different themes. Unfortunately, they haven't updated it yet for the new test, but all of the information is still really good in the videos. And it also gives the students a visual that they can see to help them understand the content a little bit better. Yeah, that preparing for oath is a great resource. It, it doesn't work very well on phones. Um, you have to download Adobe, I think, or the flash drive or something. So just a, a note to that, it might be better for you to use it than for, for the students necessarily. We are at the end of our time. And um, I hope that you found at least one thing that you can take with you that's helpful. Um, if you want, we can stay on for a few minutes. If you have questions for Aaron or uh, any of us, we can stand for a couple minutes. And then I think we'll probably have to leave this room for the next session. So we really appreciate you taking time to join us. Yeah, this was very informative. Thank you all for joining us, uh, Clara, Anna, and Aaron. It was such great information shared. Just a reminder that these slides, it's a clickable PDF. It's already in your participant folder, so you can explore all those things um, at your leisure. And then if you do have additional things you think we should add, we will add them to this slide on the screen, and then I'll just upload a new version of this to the, uh, to the participant folder. So it'll just be a live uh, link there that you can access. It also, um, this session, was recorded and it'll get posted on our YouTube channel as well. So I, I just want to give people a reminder um, that we have affinity groups meeting in um, a few minutes and I'll chat out the flyer here and you're welcome to join us for one of those. Otherwise, um, the first session in the morning, they will start at the same time. So Friday um, announcements will be at 845 and then first session begins at 915. And we'll hang out for another minute before I need to go host an affinity group. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and stop the recording. So Terry, I don't know if you mean USA Learns. I'm not familiar with the USA platform, but USA Learns platform I went into today and it was working just fine.